Muchas gracias a ustedes por acompañarnos y muchísimas gracias a los ponentes que nos van a aportar sus conocimientos y su sabiduría. El, el, la mesa de hoy tiene como nombre operativa y mantenimiento, pero lo más importante es la segunda parte del, del título, que es en edificios, en edificios más antiguos. Lo que nos van a presentar los distintos ponentes tiene que ver no con lo que entendemos por el FM, la parte posterior, la parte finalizada, cuando ha finalizado la obra, cuando ha finalizado el proyecto, sino con lo que pasa antes. En edificios existentes, en edificios históricos, el mantenimiento empieza antes que el BIM. Entonces, para no perder más tiempo, voy a dejar que cada uno de los ponentes se presente a sí mismo. El primero es Stephen Fay, por favor. Eh, les dejo con él. Él mismo se presentará y explicará lo que está haciendo desde la Universidad de Canadá. Muchas gracias. Thanks very much. Um, this isn't actually my presentation. That's up on the. Well, I'm really uh, very honored to uh, to be here uh, today, and uh, I think this is a very important uh, important event. And I wish we had some of these kinds of events in Canada. Um, So first of all, uh, my name is Stephen Fai. I'm uh, a professor at the Israeli School of Architecture and Urbanism in Ottawa, uh, Canada. And uh, so where is this place? Well, that's Canada. And there's Ottawa, uh, kind of in the, uh, just east of nowhere. Uh, we're located between uh, Ottawa and, uh, or sorry, Toronto and, uh, and Montreal. And uh, Ottawa is the, uh, it's the national capital of Canada, for those of you who um, didn't pass your geography lessons in school. So what is a Carleton Immersive Media Studio? Uh, it's a Carleton University Research Center. We're affiliated with the Israeli School of Architecture and Urbanism. We were established in 2002. Um, the first director was my colleague Michael Gemtrude. Um, he founded the, the, the lab in 2002. And then in 2007, he left the university. And I was uh, given the gift of becoming the director of, uh, of SIMS. And what I did at the time is I took the lab in quite a radical direction from the way Michael had been, had been pursuing uh, research. And um, I turned almost immediately to um, looking at building information modeling. My concern with the kind of modeling he was doing at the time, he was using uh, Maya Studio 3D Max, very high-end rendered models with absolutely no value beyond an animation. And it seemed to me uh, almost criminal that you would spend a million dollars to make a model and only have one function for it. So um, we started looking at building information modeling way back in 2007. Um, I would invite you to, to visit our website. Um, uh, you can look at some of our projects. We have a very wide range of projects. I'm just going to talk about one specific project uh, today, which I, I consider our, our most important project. Um, and um, back in 2007, uh, building information modeling was still at a bit of, a, in a bit of an infancy. Uh, in some parts of the world, it still is. Um, and not only did we decide to take on building information modeling in its infancy, but we decided to apply it to heritage buildings and to existing buildings. And um, many people literally called me uh, crazy uh, in uh, gatherings like this. So just a few uh, uh, terms sort of to contextualize what it is that we do. Um, I try to avoid uh, the, the um, Uh, rabid uh, heritage conservation uh, people, the kind of radical tree, uh, you know, chain myself to the building before I'll let them knock it down kind of idea. So we've modified some of the terms. Um, architectural conservation, we think of, of again, conservation to, to, to protect from harm or to protect something from, from, destru from destruction. And it doesn't have to be an old, an old building. Uh, it can be just be a significant building or a building you care about. Uh, architectural rehabilitation, this is another area that we're very involved in. And again, to bring something back to good health, to, to restore it to, um, to, to a healthy life, right? a happy life. Um, heritage. Heritage, in our um, uh, understanding of the term, are the cultural values associated with the built environment. So the buildings aren't heritage. It's the values that we attach to those buildings that are heritage. Um, we, we have, I'm sorry, we have five streams of, five streams of research, digitization, building information, modeling, simulation, digitally assisted fabrication, and digitally assisted storytelling. And again, I'm not going to get into sort of the detail of that. Again, if you're, if you're interested, I would encourage you to have a look at our website, and the site is broken down into these five different categories. 
What I'm going to talk about today is some of the work that we're doing with Canada's Parliament building. And I say this is most, to my mind, the most significant project that we've been involved in. And this is the um, number one iconic uh, complex of buildings in Canada. Every Canadian knows this complex of buildings. And I remember as a kid growing up in the western part of uh, Canada, uh, completely um, mesmerized that there were these fairy tale buildings that existed in my country. And so I feel very honored to be able to work on them some, um, some years later. So um, we began work on this um, complex in uh, 2013, and it was a bit of a fluke, actually, uh, our involvement. Uh, we had been doing a lot of laser scanning, again, in the context of existing buildings. And um, some of our uh, collaborators within the federal government asked if we would write a report comparing photogrammetry to laser scanning as a way to capture an existing building in the context of the West Block. We wrote that report, and the project manager for the uh, rehabilitation asked us if, if he could give us a retainer so that we could think of other ways to use the data. Um, that doesn't happen very often in academia, uh, where someone just offers you money to, to, um, to imagine. So we took that offer, and uh, one of the suggestions that I made was uh, a building information model. My first question was, what is that? So I explained it to them. Uh, he said, are you some kind of consultant? This is the uh, director general. And I said, no, I'm a researcher. Uh, so he thought that was a good answer. And so he said, OK, go ahead. Let's, let's build this model. So initially, on your left-hand side, between uh, 2013 and 15, we were tasked with building uh, a model. And um, we were working in Revit. And I'll explain why that's the case. Uh, we were asked to build a model of the building prior to the rehabilitation. So the whole building was gutted. We were able to go in with our, our, some of our colleagues in the federal government, scan the in, inside and outside right down to the, to the masonry construction. This is a load-bearing masonry building. When that was finished and the rehabilitation started, our contract technically ended, but the project manager, again, was very pleased with the quality of the work, and so he asked us to stay on and, ma and to model the existing building post-rehabilitation. Uh, so. Um, this is uh, some of the point cloud data that we use to, to model the building. Um, all of the building is modeled from terrestrial laser scanning. We've, we've used no drawings, so it's all as, as, uh, as found condition. Um, for this building, there are about 1,200 individual scans uh, using a ferro focus and the Leica P40 and C10. So this is the building before uh, rehabilitation. You can see some of the construction materials. Uh, again, in, in phase one, a very high level of detail and a very high level of information because all of the finishes on the walls had been stripped off so we could see the building was naked uh, when, we, when we captured it. Uh, again, just uh, so you get a sense of some of the level of, uh, level of detail that we were able to achieve. Uh, again, this is with, uh, with Revit. And um, crazy engineering, engineer's dream, they tunneled down four stories in the courtyard of this um, a 19th century building, solid limestone, they blasted it out and built uh, additional space in, in that courtyard. So we're uh, currently modeling that a new construction. And again, this is some of the level of detail uh, with a point cloud overlay. Second phase of the project came along in uh, 2015. Again, we had finished the first phase of the west block. Uh, center block was thinking of moving into a, rehab a re rehabilitation uh, phase. So they came and had a look at the West Block. They liked what they saw. And there was a very forward-thinking project manager who decided that it was time for Canada's federal government to get into the building information modeling game. Canada has no national um, uh, guidelines, and there is no interdepartmental committee within the federal government that's discussing uh, any kind of national guidelines. We've been trying to bring them uh, together. Uh, in Canada, defense holds a lot of properties and Public Services and Procurement Canada, who we're involved with, they also hold a lot of properties. Uh, and then there are Parks Canada, there are uh, many departments, but there's no standard that's shared between them and no discussion that's happening, unfortunately. Um, so in this project, the idea was that we would prepare a model that would be handed over to the architects and engineers to begin the rehabilitation process. So um, we had to work very fast. Again, we had to work in a commercial software that we knew the, uh, the architects and engineers could, uh, could, uh, could use. Uh, 
The building is actually a hybrid of uh, steel and load-bearing masonry. It was built in uh, 1915 to 1917. The original center block burned down in, uh, in 1915. Uh, again, the model is constructed from point cloud data and from historical drawings. And this is the quality of the drawings that we were working with. There are roughly 12,000 pieces of indi individual steel. Each has been modeled uniquely and has a unique identifier. And each piece of steel is linked back to the drawing that it was taken from and to the steel catalog that the, uh, that the, um, uh, the section was taken from. So it's a, a bit like a footnote, if you will. So the model's broken down into five distinct um, uh, component models. So there's the as-found structural, the as-found shell, that's the load-bearing masonry, the roof. Um, we went through five different protocols for modeling this, this, the complexity of this kind of roof. Uh, as-found interiors, again, all based on scan data, and the slabs and circulation model. And then the, 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 feder the federated model, you can see it in the five components. Again, very high level of detail for most of the areas, particularly the special areas like the House of Commons and the Senate, this sort of ceremonial areas, if you will. Um, but very low level of information. And that's because there was no, uh, 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 no exploration as to the actual fabric of the building. And we didn't want to put in any information that we hadn't verified. Uh, so this model has now been handed over to the architects and engineers. I can't tell you who they are because it's still secret. Um, but they've gone through the model, they've checked it uh, using Salibri, and they're satisfied with the quality of the model. In fact, they said it's the best as-found model they've, uh, they've seen. Um, so I'm very proud of that. So uh, this summer we've been asked to address the east block, uh, which is the building just at the bottom of, this, uh, of, the, of the, uh, the complex here. Um, it's one of the original buildings, again, dates from the uh, late uh, 19th century, 1875, 1876, I think was the last um, edition. Um, this building was captured by our colleagues at, the, uh, at Public Works, um, Heritage Conservation Services. They captured the entire exterior facade and the interior of the cor courtyard using photogrammetry. Um, as a result, uh, there's a, the, the point cloud is very, very high quality, so it's um, very nice to model from. Uh, and this is the kind of detail that we're, that we're working toward. Um, you know, some of you are probably looking at this thing, that why go to that level of detail? Because we're a research center, so uh, uh, we can. And um, one of our uh, sort of call to arms is too much is never enough. And so we just keep, keep trying to push the, the, um, the uh, uh, level of detail, le the level of information. And again, I'm gonna come back to, to why that is at, at the end of the presentation. Um, we also modeled the underground connections between the east block and the center block. And again, this project will be, uh, will be continuing for the next couple, th three years. Uh, we'll also be doing um, uh, an energy plus model uh, derived from the, the building information model. So in the uh, west block, it was really just a record model. Center block was a model that was going to be used in the rehabilitation process. And the east block is going to be uh, public works, this, this uh, area of government, this agency of the government, it'll be their most developed uh, building information model that they've, that they've taken on. So there'll be the, um, uh, it'll be ready for the consultants, uh, but also we'll, we'll have an energy analysis and we're also modeling all of the mechanical equipment. Um, the, uh, so a as a result of this, we now have a, a what, if you will, a, a, a campus model. And um, this is the plan. So again, on your left, the west block center, the center block on the right, the west block. You see that kind of round building in the back? That's the Library of, of Parliament. It's the fifth building, the fifth element. And we've just been given the nod to record it. Uh, we haven't been given the nod to model it yet, but it's an absolutely beautiful Victorian building. Uh, these are the, some of the data sets that we've been using. So um, uh, GIS, uh, Civil 3D, as well as our own scan data. Uh, and we brought that all together just to, to verify um, the, um, um, the information and have built a uh, topographic model. Now, um, as part of the campus model, um, we've developed um, detailed protocols for all novel modeling procedures that we've used. So if, if there's a YouTube video on it, then we don't do a protocol. But if it's something that we've developed on our own, as I mentioned, we did five iterations for a roof, for modeling those kinds of the complexity and the deformations in that uh, 19th century roof. Um, we, we've written it out and uh, in a step-by-step -step, uh, protocol. 
So that means that there's consistent protocols all across all three of the buildings. But we, as we improve the modeling process, we go back to the previous building and remodel it. So the whole campus is modeled to the same, uh, the same level of detail and the same, uh, following the same, same protocols. And of course, this is also very valuable when handing the model over to the, uh, to the architects and engineers. Um, we also came up with a verification system for um, level of accuracy. So anything that's in green has been verified on both sides to point cloud. Anything in yellow has been verified maybe on one side to point cloud, or in the case of some of the steel, it's been covered with a fire retardant. Um, so we can't say it, with, with, with um, absolute certainty that um, uh, the, the building is as, 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 we've, as we've modeled it. Uh, red is there is no point cloud data available, so it's, it's modeled from some secondary source. And the purple means uh, you need to go on site and have a look at that, we have a problem. And that's, that was a, a kind of an internal uh, check that we developed. But again, we've handed all this over to the, uh, to the consultants, and they, they seem quite happy. Um, uh, all of the point clouds, so all of, uh, 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 actually all of our targets are tied into a, a known geo-referenced uh, survey system. So all of the, as a result, all of the point clouds are geo-referenced. As a result, the, BIM is, uh, the BIMs, I suppose, are geo-referenced to real-world coordinates. Now, um, anticipated uses. Uh, obviously, facilities management and operations. Now, this is something that when I mention this to most of the people in the federal government right now, there's kind of a blank face. Because for them, it's not their responsibility, the people that we're working with, it's not their responsibility to worry about facilities management. They, just, they need to get these rehabilitation projects done. So they say, you, know, you, you want to worry about that, you go talk to this, uh, this person over here. And you all know what happens when you go talk to that person over there. Um, security is another um, area that um, uh, the, the RCMP, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, have identified as a, a potential value in the model. Finally, uh, storytelling. And I just wanted to touch on this briefly. Again, the level of detail. And in many buildings, perhaps, this, the notion of storytelling or heritage might not be so important. But for a building like the center block, which is, again, the iconic symbol of, of Canada, as the architectural symbol of Canada, that building is going to be closed for 10 to 15 years. So they receive about a million visitors a year at, uh, at the center block. Um, there'll be a whole generation of kids who won't have access to that building. So they've asked us to come up with ways to leverage the campus model, leverage the model of the center block in order to tell Canadians the story of what happened at the center block, how did it come to be, what's happening now, and what is it going to be in the future? Um, so we've developed a number of, uh, of applications. Um, right now, there's a virtual reality experience right across from the uh, center block that, again, leverages the models and, and the point clouds that we've already developed and the 360 photospheres that we've developed uh, to uh, give color value to the, to the point clouds. Uh, and now we're working on this uh, website, which will be launched July 1st, which is Canada Day. And uh, this is going to tell one story every month for the next five years um, about the Parliament buildings. And uh, the Assistant Deputy Minister is really pumped up about this project and is suggesting we could make it last 10 years. So that should take me well into my retirement. Thank you. I look forward to any, any questions you might have. Gracias por la brevedad. Nuestro siguiente ponente es Tero, viene de eh, Finlandia, de la empresa Grandlund, y nuevamente dejaré el que se presente, que lo hará muchísimo mejor. So, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Tero Jarvinen, I come from Finland. Ground Oil is our company, and uh, I'm a technology director at the Innovation and Development Department. So I have too many slides, sorry. I will go really fast, some slides, and uh, for example, our mandatory company uh, slides, what we are, this is quite fast. I already shared this presentation to LinkedIn and Twitter and so on, so you can find it from slide share if you want, want to see. 
Uh, what Granlund is doing, we are doing in mechanical designing and consultants, uh, mainly these areas, but are not in a residential uh, area. Hospitals are quite big in our, our turnover, and data centers are rising all the time because of Finnish, Finnish weather and the condition, electrical conditions and all these things. These kind of projects we are doing right now, there are all the hospitals, and uh, the, this is the amount of people what we have. HVAC and electrical designing is the main part of our business. Uh, this mission critical means data centers, and as I said, I'm coming from innovation and development department. We have about 11 or 10 people working only in the innovation and development, it's not at project work at all. And also we are a software company, so we have Granlund Manager, which is for facility management, and Granlund Designer, which is for uh, designing and construction phase. Designer is a, a mechanical equipment device schedule software, and a manager is like a real FM software. But manager does not have any connections to building information models, and that's why I have that presentation that maybe uh, we could have that kind of connections. Yes, we are making money, and uh, we, are, we are spending money also. So, so, so this is our investment in the last year. So in a ground group, this 750 people, it's a 7% of turnover goes to, to, not to me, but <laughs> in our department. And we have lots of involvement in EU projects and different kind of research projects, projects also. We have a strategy, what we are going to do. So now we are in a phase that we are gathering information, we are making slight analyzing of information, but we want to create reporting facility, we want to make, take forecasts how facility is behaving, and we want to have a possibility to learn. The facility will learn itself when it has, has these uh, first steps ready. So we are not thinking just the facility, we are thinking the people inside of the facility. So we want to be in a situation that, that there is a user and a facility which are communicating each other. When I walk out of here, the facility knows where I'm going. I, I will accept that. Every, every people, they do not accept that kind of uh, thing that you, you are tracked. But it's, it's, it's something that we want to uh, research more. Okay, then to the point. Uh, concept of our BIM to FM. So this is our, our working name, B building information models in use in FM or, or whatever. BIM to FM is our word when we are talking about these things. Uh, this is something that we need to understand quite well when we are talking about models. So in the lower level here uh, is a designing. So we are designing buildings and then uh, general contractors are making the buildings. And at this part is uh, lots of have lots of information, lots of information storage, and uh, lots of uh, loose connections that uh, we have lots of information but they are not connected at all. So when we are putting these kind of as-built models, that we have the uh, grounding okay when we have as-built models, we need to enrich the information for if we want to use the information in technical operations. But where we are focusing, where is ground manager is now. Uh, it's a software for property portfolio management to people who are interested about euros. De designers and are maybe interested about kilowatt hours. So we need to go to the money. And uh, nowadays, these decisions in the building in this, this area is made like a rule of thumb or that so some other building is behaving also like that. So I will drive, uh, write something similar what that other, other building is doing. So big decisions are made just by uh, knowing the good professionality what the people have in that level. So we want to give the information to them to have uh, uh, decisions make, make by knowledge. And that there is a business use cases and somewhere here middle is a information models to facility management. I don't know where it is, but it's somewhere there for my opinion. And uh, we have searched about five years that red line, and we are still searching. But now we are quite, quite far for searching, and we may know, we maybe know uh, what we're going to do in the next year or next two before we have the software. 
So these are like my theses, the beam to FM. Okay. So information, what we have, it has to be standardized. Uh, it has to be machine readable. We, in Finland, we are using IFC heavily. In every project, uh, we create IFCs. For example, design and construction project, we do not uh, care what software other companies are using. Everybody is uh, providing IFC to the project bank. Everybody is downloading the IFCs and putting together in their own own company and uh, looking at combined federated models. So, but the content is not standardized. Uh, when, when, I, when we are talking about uh, different architectural companies or different structural designers, uh, we have different kind of content all the time. So it's like a learning in every project, and that's a hell. But in facility management, we need standardized information. Uh, there are too much information in our models. So information has to be prioritized. So building owner or us as a consultant need to tell them uh, what is important in your building. What kind of network is something that uh, you want to care of? And uh, we cannot uh, access, we cannot update all the information that we have because the information amount is so huge. So prioritize it. It has to be in a cloud. So it has to be available all the time, information. Uh, information is not transferred, uh, it's linked. And this is a quite uh, complicated task to fulfill. But uh, if we transfer the information to software to software, we have always uh, old and wrong information and some other systems. So there has to be connections. Uh, it has to be updated. There are, in the morning, the term digital twin was also, also in uh, other, other session room. And uh, that's, that's true, and I believe in that idea that we have like a digital building and a real building, and we have to update both. So maintenance is going to real building, and updating is going to the digital building. And uh, we can simulate the digital building to next week, to, and, and so on. So we are like playing on the, on the digital, mm -hmm. digital building, and uh, that is steering the real building. This is something that we want to be involved. That's to, we do not have yet. Uh, FM operations, they will be different. So uh, we need to change. That's the, that's the fact. Uh, this, is, this, this, uh, this means that um, what Stephen was saying also, that in uh, Finland, uh, construction organizations are like an own silo. And uh, FM organizations are own other silo. Even they are working in the same company, uh, there are different people and different departments, and they do not understand each other. And uh, what we need to create is like a bridge of these organizations. And uh, there has to be somebody telling when we start make designing uh, well, how building owner wants to use uh, models in facility management, and it's done by FM coordinator. So this kind of a role is new, at least in Finland. He has to understand uh, models, and he has to understand facility management also, and use cases what they want to take there. So a little bit of complexity of the mechanical models. This is a, a hospital, a renovated hospital in Helsinki. Uh, was it a 17 story or high or something like that? And this is the amount of objects in that model. So we can see that we have uh, almost half a million objects in a mechanical model and comparing to architectural model, it's something like 25,000. So, so complexity in mechanical, model, mechanical models are really huge. So that's why we need prioritization. We need to have about 50,000 objects or something that we can update. It, we, there is no use to put models inside of the facility management software if you are not willing to update the information. Uh, this is what is important, so like decision making, you need to decide which is important. If I'm in the operating theater, uh, I hope mechanical designer has connect the electricity on the, on the spare power also. But if the, in office, if the heating pump is uh, run down, is, is broken, I'm, there is no hurry. I have two time, two, two days, two day time to fix it. So we need to make decisions. Uh, facility management information is not inside of the graphical models. As I said, we are using IFC heavily. IFC has lots of information, but uh, we cannot 
update that information without opening native software, for example. For example, Revit uh, or, or, or how, that's how. Uh, facility management managers cannot use Revit. They cannot use building information modern softwares. That's the fact, because they are not engineer, engineers. They are not like a, they, they don't have a mindset to understand what is building information model. That's why we need to uh, simplify the information and create env create environment uh, where they have like uh, multiple different use cases, like apps to do something, which is really simplified. And that's how we need links to databases. Uh, mechanical, in the mechanical world, uh, all the important information is on the device settles. All the central units, all the filters, all, all, the, all this kind of information lies on the different database. It's not inside of the Revit model or IFC model. There is object, there is, there is like a GUID, what we can use in a, in a graphical model, but the information is on a different database, and that's we need to connect. And when we have these two information sources, we have like all to, to update the mechanical models. Uh, how, uh, well, I will skip this. This, this means that uh, how to update, the, uh, how to create as-built models. So in uh, designing phase, we are creating a device settle using Grand Designer. It's a cloud-based software. We make approval packages and uh, give login names and password to contractor. Contractor sees what we have uh, put in our, our database and they success some other device because it's a cheaper. And uh, that's normal in Nordic, country, Nordic countries that contractor change everything what the designer has designed. A strange situation, but that's how it is. And uh, then designer makes approval, reject or accept, and so on. And the end result is that through this process, we have as built information in our database uh, without extra work because the approval has to be done. Uh, has to be done. Uh, where we are now in IFC in Finland, so for my opinion, the construction uh, phase, designing phase, is going quite good. So we know what to do. Uh, there is a little bit debate all the time, the accuracy of our model. I could say that our accuracy of a mechanical model is 5 to 2 centimeters, so 0 to 5 centimeters. And uh, that should be enough for a contractor, but some contractor does not accept that kind of accuracy. Uh, we are designers. We are not making uh, models to make the installations. So th that, that's why we want to have that uh, possibility to have a little tolerance in our models. Because also the huge amount of information and graphical pipes and ducts what we have in, in models. So what we are learning is now, when we are going to facility management, that we need to standardize the information. So we are uh, we are dealing with IFCs, and we are a little bit tweaking IFCs information and uh, device cell information that should be standardized. And after we have that, kind, that done, uh, we can start using models in facility management. But if you, when you are putting information to software, uh, this has to be standardized because we cannot make prototypes for every building. It has to be, from software side, it has to look the same. Dep depending on the build buildings. Uh, Role-based information is the keyword also. So when we have a central place, like not, not one place, but multiple places where we have information, it depends your role, what you can see. For example, designer creates device settles. He is interested about pumps and air, air handy units. Uh, supervisor, or maybe not in interested detail, detail level, but he wants to know what is accept or reject, what kind of equi equipment there are. Building owner w wants to do s see something else. But the main thing is that the information is, is uh, scattered in a uh, cloud, and it's linked. And uh, people are looking the information through different roles. So this is what we are now, now doing. Uh, we have, for example, a Revit model, and we have put it that to the IFC, and we have some information coming from IFC. So we are, we are not using all the information because it's meaningless to facility management. We have device schedule information, building automation system information, or IoT sensor inf information, 
And if I click something, I can see a whole bunch of information. Problem is now that uh, the same information is in other places also. So how to decide uh, what is the correct information? That's the problem now, nowadays. And at a technical point of view, this is what we are be believing. So I will show rapidly this center part uh, after a couple of minutes. But we are creating documented APIs. So open data is really great, but uh, capacity management information cannot be open. It can be standardized, it can be documented, but it, uh, we cannot deliver information from building to all, all, all of the world without authentications and these kind of things. So basically, uh, we are creating like a platform where we could, uh, it's a bridge where we could have, for example, IoT sensor information uh, shown here, and we have uh, space information from facility management software, and uh, we link this to information, and when I click the space, I can see the temperature of that space. That's like a basic thing. And also building automation systems uh, have quite poor APIs, but we could connect to them also. In Finland, uh, we can connect almost every manufacturer building automation system and uh, gather information and show information uh, like you that you understand it. All the information is inside of the building automation system, but it's in the format that only technicians can understand what there is. We want to bring one level more. So this is something that I do not understand, but this is something that I believe. So, so this is like a semantic web uh, linked data. We have a research project, Drumbeat, going on in Finland. And uh, this means that uh, all, all different software parts are linked together somehow magically, automatically, I don't know. But they are, the professors say, say to me that, okay, it's, it could be like that. I'm, I'm believer. And also Tecla is there. So there is maybe some black box where we put all the information and suddenly we have correct information. I don't know. But I can see that our softwares are here like uh, one dot there and one dot there and some other software is here. So we want to connect to as many softwares as possible to have the correct and information from multiple sources. So I will now show this demo. So this is from Senate Properties uh, building Finnish National Museum. And uh, this is a prototype. This is not a software. This is straight from our developer's uh, desktop. And uh, he hates when I show it because he do not know all the time is it working. But all this information is coming from IoT sensor of these spaces. This information is coming from uh, open source, uh, open data from Hel city of Helsinki. And uh, here you can, t you can see temperatures, you can change the floor. Uh, if I want to see a little bit uh, more, I can see like a trend. And all this information is already inside of that building, but it's on multiple locations that the people inside of this museum does not have a view, the information which is collected on one place. And uh, there's also relative humidity sensors and so on. Next phase is that because there are like, what is the correct word, vitrines, you know, where are inside is something which, <laughs> something which is inside of the museum. So we will have like equipment also inside of the spaces, so they can really fast see if everything is okay. In the morning when they go to work, everything's green, great, let's go to work. If there's some red or something else, there may be some problems. Yeah, so I hope, I hope that was my presentation, I hope I'm in time. Thank you. Bueno, pues muy bien, vamos ganando minutos. El tercer ponente, Alberto, muchas gracias, te presentas tú mismo. Hola, buenas tardes, soy Alberto Armisen, el promotor de, de este proyecto que se llama Petrovin. Alguno igual ya ha oído hablar de él, porque en las redes sociales somos bastante pesados. Y bueno, lo que pretendemos con Petrovin... Vale. 
pretendemos con PetroBIM es eh, llevar el BIM al patrimonio. Petro viene de piedra, no de petróleo, como mucha gente me ha dicho, eh, y lo hacemos de una forma peculiar, y es que no trabajamos con estándares. Eh, PetroBIM trabaja con edificios históricos de siglos o de muchos años, donde pues, todo lo que le envuelve y lo que lo conforma pues está, está constituido por, bueno, por piedras de cantería, etcétera, etcétera. Bien, eh, para empezar, lo que vimos, un equipo de técnicos, científicos, universidad, catedráticos, ingenieros, arquitectos, que, que están detrás de este proyecto, es que en el mundo del patrimonio eh, hay un cierto desorden, ¿no? es un cierto desorden, eh, al igual que ha venido sucediendo o que viene sucediendo en el mundo de la, de la um, obra nueva. ¿no? Para ello concebimos una plataforma virtual, entendiendo eh, como virtual, porque trabajamos con edificios virtuales, para proyectos técnicos de estudio, gestión y difusión del patrimonio. Y lo de difusión, aunque no está subrayado aquí, lo, lo, lo subrayamos, eh, de un patrimonio histórico en entornos BIM. ¿no? Esto es lo que nosotros entendemos como HBIM. Eh, mucha gente bautiza, eh, utiliza la H de, de Heritage con, bueno, con el fin de aproximarse lo más posible al patrimonio, pero no siempre se consigue, porque mm, trabajar con ladrillos estándares en, en, una, en un edificio que en realidad lo que tiene en vez de un ladrillo es una arenisca del siglo XIV, pues tiene poco que ver, ¿no? Bueno, una necesidad que era poner orden al desorden. Eh, los geólogos, petrólogos, arqueólogos, arquitectos, técnicos que conforman un proyecto o que trabajan en un proyecto de restauración eh, o que están eh, al amparo de un plan director, eh, se encuentran de esta manera. Se encuentran muchas veces en, un, en una forma caótica. ¿Por qué? Pues porque cada uno está en su gabinete y cuando tienen que vertir la información a al responsable del, del proyecto o del plan director, eh, bueno, pues se tropiezan con, unos van con planos en papel, otros van con dibujos eh, eh, con colores a mano alzada. Eh, la tecnología brilla por su ausencia en, en algunos casos. ¿no? Y entonces decidimos crear una herramienta sobre la que se pueda proyectar y capaz de albergar toda esa documentación que los técnicos han ido mm, gestionando en el transcurso de los siglos, en muchos casos. Luego vamos a ver un, un caso eh, muy, muy, bueno, pues, que nos va a hacer reflexionar mucho. Y es, toda esta, esta documentación está asociada a la conservación y al mantenimiento de un monumento histórico y bien cultural de manera atractiva e intuitiva. ¿Por qué lo hemos con, eh, considerado así? Bueno, pues porque hoy... Mm, Siempre que se interviene sobre un bien de interés cultural, eh, la mayoría, bueno, he dicho siempre no, pero la mayoría de las veces se hace de forma reactiva. O sea, llegamos cuando ya ha habido el colapso de la cubierta, llegamos cuando ya nos han comido los hongos hasta metro y medio, llegamos cuando las humedades han derrumbado eh, parte de, de cierto muro. Bueno, pues eh, lo que hemos tratado es eh, de hacer que esta iniciativa permita que todos intervengan, arquitectos, aparejadores, arqueólogos, etcétera, etcétera, y se comuniquen con los protocolos válidos, ¿no? IFC, BCF, DXF, etcétera. Nosotros trabajamos desde la entrada hasta la salida con archivos que todo el mundo conoce y que para nadie resulta novedoso. Y cómo no de forma colaborativa, que es, digamos, el, el sentir o el padecer o el, el karma del, de, de, de BIM, ¿no? convirtiendo esto en una herramienta integradora y eficaz, aumentando la productividad. Si nos damos cuenta, el modelo virtual es sobre el cual gira toda la gestión, toda la información, esto no olvidemos, luego lo vamos a ver, que esto es un repositorio de información que puede ser consultada desde un nivel turístico hasta un nivel muy científico. Generamos por ello una conservación efectiva y preventiva, tanto en cuanto eh, Petrovin nos permite alimentar la el modelo de información que genere alertas de mantenimiento, y esto lleva a ahorro y servicio de, de costes en los planes directores ¿no? o en los proyectos. Normalmente eh, la tecnología se viene utilizando, bueno, la tecnología, los planes directores vienen utilizando algo de tecnología, pero bueno, aún así eh, es muy escasa para poder llevar, para poder disponer de unas bill real. Se trata de la metodología BIM aplicada a los proyectos de conservación y restauración del patrimonio histórico. 
Integramos toda la información en la nube para la gestión de proyectos sólidos y robustos en un entorno visual, navegable y vivo. Si, si veis esta imagen, luego bueno, pues, eh, haré trabajar sobre el modelo real. Esta imagen eh, le hemos generado una serie de consultas. ¿no? En, me voy a poner las gafas porque no veo. Bueno, si os dais cuenta, hemos seleccionado la pestaña de elementos constructivos. Esta es una pestaña, bueno, o un módulo, que conforma el número de módulos que exigen en España todas las intervenciones que se aplican a bienes de interés cultural, cultural y a planes directores recogidos dentro de los planes nacionales. Por lo tanto, aquí nadie se ha inventado nada. ¿Mm? Aquí hemos hecho una consulta, elementos constructivos, y hemos seleccionado los, los, que nos muestre los escultóricos y toda la fábrica que hay y la ornamentación. Automáticamente, por una paleta de colores, nos muestra esa información en distintos tonos y a la derecha pues, podemos ver el número de elementos, la superficie que ocupa y su volumen. ¿no? La arquitectura de la herramienta. Bueno, partimos de planos. Este modelo, este modelo que habéis visto está, eh, se realizó a mano alzada, es un, es un trabajo que hizo un arquitecto eh, asturiano hace un montón de años y que, bueno, pues la documentación gráfica que existía era, era su documentación a mano alzada, que es la que veis ahí arriba, que luego, bueno, evidentemente se llevó a, a una planimetría de WG, a partir de la cual nosotros levantamos el modelo en Google SketchUp y, y luego ahí late nuestra tecnología. Exportamos un FBX, lo metemos en el corazón Petrobin, el corazón Petrobin late vincula toda la geometría de los sillares con todos los identificadores de ese con, con toda la información vinculada a ese identificador y como hemos visto antes nos muestra la información consultada accedemos a esta plataforma gestionándola, gestionándola por niveles de permiso según el usuario ¿no? podemos filtrar los oficios y los gremios dependiendo de, de la categoría o dependiendo del nivel de acceso que se pretenda nosotros estructuramos y establecemos el nivel de detalle, dependiendo de la. Bueno, el LOD que se aplica en patrimonio depende de, de, de la necesidad de la intervención. Aquí, como podéis ver, bueno, pues es una malla que recoge bueno, pues un, un ornamento en, en, en una especie. Bueno, un ornamento en la catedral de Segovia. Y esta, y esta y este ornamento pues tiene una, una, una triangulación muy grande, porque podemos acceder o debemos acceder para tratarlo hasta ese nivel de información. Sin embargo, en esta otra imagen que hay abajo, que es la, la Catedral de Palma de Mallorca, aquí solamente se, han, eh, se, se ha trabajado a nivel de sillar eh, con una información solo arquitectónica, donde eh, no nos ha importado para nada la parte del retablo, ni los ornamentos, ni nada que, a, que en este caso al arquitecto le importase. ¿no? La descripción de la herramienta, bueno, se accede a través de un código de acceso, accedemos a una carpeta donde figuran o están todos nuestros proyectos y digamos que un poco la, la, la presentación nos permite ver los módulos de trabajo que están en la izquierda, esos ocho módulos donde tenemos las intervenciones, eh, análisis de las patologías, las humedades, la sensórica, el mantenimiento, etc. Eh, luego la visualización del modelo que nos mostrará toda la información, incluso cruzada, que hemos previamente eh, consultado antes, y luego nos aparece esa leyenda en la que visualizamos pues, la, la consulta generada. Si os dais cuenta, a la izquierda del todo bueno, hay una serie de herramientas que llamamos un poco CAD, que nos permiten pues, hacer mediciones sobre, sobre, la, sobre el, el modelo, etcétera, etcétera. Bueno, estas son distintas herramientas que nos permiten hacer secciones eh, a distinta altura, eh, para comprobar distintas eh, secuencias o fases, etc. En, en la parte de proyectos eh, tenemos las pestañas de información general, la parte de modelo, la parte de usuarios y en qué régimen acceden y luego la parte de documentación. Esa parte de documentación genera una serie de subcarpetas que va enriqueciendo el modelo, de tal manera que la herencia que se deja a quien precede al que lleva el mantenimiento de este modelo está actualizada. No es como ahora que en la Catedral de Segovia, eh, bueno, pues una empresa, la empresa que, re, que restauró 
una, una de las cubiertas, un tramo de la cubierta, diez años después le han vuelto a pedir que restaure exactamente lo mismo, a la misma empresa. Y la empresa, pues bueno, pues fue en este y dijo, pero ¿por qué me lo volvéis a pedir? Y dijo, pero esto está hecho. Pues, pues, pues es así, a veces este mundo eh, del patrimonio se encuentra un poco despistado, ¿no? Y hemos intentado eh, enfocarlo y reorientarlo. Bueno, Aquí podemos encontrar, esta es la capilla que os comentaba, la del Sagrado Corazón, aquí podemos acceder a un nivel de, de selección filtrando lo que nos interesa trabajar. En este caso, bueno, pues vamos a las nervaduras, a los apliques de, que existen en las nervaduras, también conservamos todo lo que es la parte de vidriera, porque queremos intervenir directamente sobre eso, el resto nos molesta. Es una manera de poder aislarlo y trabajar cómodamente. Si os dais cuenta, bueno, esto forma parte de una capilla completa, eh, que es una de las 26 capillas que tiene la Catedral de, de Palma. Aquí podemos individualizar el elemento para que los eh, restauradores puedan intervenir y trabajar directamente sobre el retablo y siempre bajo una metodología, metodología BIM, porque trabajamos siempre sobre un modelo, trabajamos siempre de forma colaborativa, trabajamos siempre sobre unos protocolos de intercambio válidos y trabajamos siempre sobre una usabilidad compatible. Quiere decir esto... Eh, bueno, pues que eh, obedece a los cánones que prescribe o va a prescribir la administración cuando exija el BIM en sus pliegos de condiciones. ¿no? Eh, el otro día, Íñigo de la Serna, el ministro, hablaba de que iba a destinar el 1,5%, son 430 millones de euros, eh, esperemos que sea verdad, independientemente de que el Ministerio de de que cultura y deporte pues destine otro tanto, el Instituto de Patrimonio eh, destine otro tanto, creemos que además como el 2018 es el año mm, europeo del patrimonio, pues eh, va a haber un, mucho trabajo en esta dirección. Eh, se abre una línea de negocio grande, gracias a que aquí eh, intervienen muchos técnicos que ahora mismo pues, se encuentran con poco trabajo. Bien, es cierto que no cabe duda que como estamos eh, tratando de evangelizar tanto en la sala grande de la que venimos como aquí, pues ese cambio de filosofía, ese cambio de chip es determinante, es clave. Este es un ejemplo que os iba a comentar, esta Santa Cristina que está en la cuenca minera en Pola de Elena, está levantada sobre una loma, es preciosa, es un prerrománico asturiano y bueno, aquí hay un, un análisis mmm, patológico resultante. Aquí tenemos las plumas de humedad. Estoy haciendo un, un repaso un poquito largo, no, largo más que largo, estoy haciendo un repaso rápido porque la, la herramienta entra muy en profundidad y, y tengo el tiempo que tengo. Entonces, bueno, procuro más o menos que de un vistazo os podáis hacer una idea de hasta dónde se puede llegar. ¿no? Y esto es lo que os quería contar antes. Aquí donde lo veis, este edificio, se ha hecho una selección donde las pestañas que hemos clicado muestran distintas fases constructivas. Y efectivamente aquí hay una fase constructiva que es morada, otra verde, que es un recrecido del edificio, otra rosa. Bueno, ¿esto a qué responde? Si nos seleccionamos en la parte verde, esto responde a una reposición que hubo como consecuencia de una deflagración en la guerra en el 37 de la, de la, eh, sí, en la República, y es la época de Ferrán, donde estos sillares, muchos de ellos se fueron a las casas de los habitantes del pueblo, porque se las llevaron para, para hacer sus cuadras, etc., y otras proceden de unas canteras que hay por allí. Y entonces tenemos la posibilidad de aislar y trabajar directamente con, ese, con esos elementos. Esto a nivel histórico, a nivel cultural, es una información bestial. ¿Por qué bestial? Porque sin, darnos, o sea, sin, sin, sin ir más lejos que... Eh, que una mera circulación por el monumento, bueno, ya hemos recorrido fases, unas fases constructivas, ya hemos visto el tipo de patologías, podemos trabajar sobre la fase afectada de manera individualizada. Bueno, esto, esto es un BIM en toda regla, ¿no? Es un HBIM, porque mmm, en PetroBIM creemos que nosotros verdaderamente nos merecemos la H. No queremos desmerecer a nadie, pero que no, soy, que, que no todo el mundo sea Project Manager o que no todo el mundo sea BIM Manager, que no todo el mundo... O sea, que las cosas son como son y entendemos que nos ha costado mucho completar esta herramienta para que sea un HBIM. ¿Qué conseguimos? Desde luego tenemos un aspil vivo que se retroalimenta, 
eh, cuando decimos vivo, eh, que es sensible de actualizaciones posteriores. Y luego hay una de las cosas que, que, sobre la que más incido, y es que cuando hemos trabajado a este nivel de información, eh, con un código de acceso para que trabajen nuestros técnicos, los que trabajan en nuestro entorno, eh, ese código de acceso con, la, con, con, la, con, la limita, con, con un formato de solo lectura lo podemos poner en cualquier universidad del mundo, de tal forma que ven cómo en España, que es uno de los tres países más importantes del mundo en patrimonio, trabaja sus monumentos. Y en las universidades, o en las facultades, o en los laboratorios, verán, cuando cliquen en un sillar, qué porosidad, qué grado de alteración, qué salinidad, qué parámetros hemos utilizado o hemos dado para dar a conocer o para conservar este bien que está ahí para verlo. ¿no? Y entonces, ¿esto qué hace? Bueno, un efecto rebote, que al final pues, se genere, se sensibilice la gente y quiera venir a verlo, ¿no? que al final pues, es un poco lo que perseguimos. Esto a nivel político es, un, es una medalla, esto es el dinero tra, trasladado al, a la, al impacto. ¿no? Bueno, luego tenemos el, el, el capítulo de intervención en donde bueno, pues tenemos una pequeña base de datos con, una, bueno, con la capacidad de generar pequeñas estimaciones presupuestarias para que nosotros podamos hacer un, un pequeño presupuesto. Toda la base de datos que está aquí generada, toda la alimentación en, de, está regida y está sujeta al ICOMOS y Coremans, que es la publicación que, que, por la que se, se está velando, no, por la que el, el Instituto, lo diré, el ICOMOS, efectivamente, eh, sobre la que el ICOMOS eh, ha establecido los criterios y las bases de datos para que podamos alimentar esto en, con los términos adecuados. Bien, esto es una de las, una de las eh, partidas, uno de los módulos que trabaja el mantenimiento. Aquí, si os dais cuenta, tenemos bueno, pues la limpieza de la pátina biológica, que está en la, parte de, en la parte próxima al suelo. La frecuencia debe de ser semestral, la fecha de inicio del plan, bueno, el 1 de enero del 2016, y el email que va a recibir pues, eh, cultura arroba, cultura .es, pues es quien llevará la alerta para que se pueda llevar a cabo esa acción. Y luego, además, pues... Eh, este Jesús Hidalgo, que es el responsable de patrimonio, pues tendrá que darle al ok, como diciendo que se ha hecho esa, esa intervención. Eh, no quiero terminar sin antes enseñaros, si es que puedo, que creo que puedo, y si tengo tiempo, José, un minuto, madre mía. Parece que estoy tocándolo. Y ahora otra vez. Bueno, trabaja en la nube, accedemos a la nube, se actualiza en la nube, podemos estar trabajando en casa sin conexión y se actualiza en el momento en el que haya conexión. No sé cómo andamos de, de wifi aquí. Bien, este es el modelo. Si veis, eh, con 4.700 elementos, podemos hacerle una serie de consultas, como que la visualización de este sillar... Y aquí nos aparecen sus características, ¿no? Piedra roca sedimentaria, color blanco, densidad, etcétera, etcétera. Podemos editar la información de este sillar a nivel de campaña, información básica. Podemos aumentar e enriquecer los modelos. Eh, y luego hay una parte, bueno, pues que es eh, de sensórica, que antes estaban hablando a la hora de llevar el facility... que algunos ya conoceréis este, este sistema de monitorización, que es de la Fundación Santa María de la Real y Telefónica, que luego no se diga que no, que no trabajamos con, con nuestras empresas españolas. 
Y, y bueno, pues era, quería mostraros cómo somos capaces de mover este modelo, que no son más de 100 metros cuadrados, y otros modelos, pues como la Universidad Laboral, que está en Gijón, que tiene 300.000 metros cuadrados de superficie, y que solamente os la voy a enseñar sin entrar a más detalles, porque José me está mirando con cara de... voy a acabar contigo. Eh, si es que la tengo aquí a tiro. Bueno, pues esto era un poco los que, lo que os quería enseñar, que no hay, no hay límites de tamaño, eh, no hay, no hay límite para poder llevar un proyecto adelante y, y que, bueno, en patrimonio España tiene que dar una lección a nivel mundial. Creemos, porque quienes estamos o formamos parte de la familia Building Smart, eh, nosotros nos hemos incorporado hace poquito, creemos que podemos dar una lección no solo a nivel europeo, sino a nivel mundial, eh, porque sabemos muy bien lo que es trabajar el patrimonio y creemos de verdad que somos el primer país que trabaja HBIM de verdad. Nada más. Muchas gracias. Disponemos de cuatro minutos para poder responder preguntas. Si alguien tiene alguna consulta concreta para alguno de los ponentes, por favor. Ángel. Sí, para empezar. A mí me gustaría saber si también incluís documentación histórica de Totalmente, es clave, es determinante, porque eh, la documentación histórica forma parte del patrimonio, es inherente. Y de hecho, cuando, cuando hablaba de, de ese código de acceso en las universidades, de lo que se trata es de que se enteren de la historia. ¿no? Es, esa deflagración es historia, eso no puede... Claro, claro, por eso aquí hay historiadores que velan porque efectivamente la información que se aporte también sea una documentación gráfica. Decía el, el, el director del plan director de la Catedral de Oviedo, Jorge Evia, decía, eh, Alberto, voy a agotar el presupuesto y quiero, por favor, que Petrovín sea mi colofón. ¿Por qué? Porque después de 20 años dirigiendo ese proyecto, tengo todo el repositorio histórico de la información de la Catedral desde las distintas guerras que han pasado por ella hasta la pues todo ese archivo histórico eh, bueno pues las intervenciones que se han hecho en la, en la, en la el Santo Sudario que tiene la, la, la ay por Dios eh, cómo está el Santo Sudario en Oviedo cómo se llama eh, bueno no me sale bien pues eh, toda sea una historia eh, para, para él sería y será si todo sigue en marcha pues será y ahora estamos trabajando bueno, pues con catedrales, estamos con la de Burgos haciendo alguna cosa, estamos con la de Palma de Mallorca, eh, aquí en Barcelona con, pues, estamos empezando, ya que el laboratorio que está analizando mucho de las rocas de la Sagrada Familia es, es parte de este proyecto, que es GEA, pues estamos eh, bueno, tentando, ¿no? lo que pasa es que bueno, son proyectos de envergadura, etc. Y hay que estructurarlos bien. Así que... Está. Muchas gracias. Any questions for Tero or Stefan? For one? Tero, one question. Is IOC file format enough for facility management? Do you need to add new PCs or? Yeah, the format in IOC is enough because basically I'm not sure now what I'm going to say, but the format in IOC is enough because basically IOC is transfer format. So I want to create.
se on itse asiassa silly. Sitten vaan. Well, I, I speak really loud, so, so, <laughs> so we want to transfer IFC information and uh, then get rid of IFC information, but we have the same information elsewhere, which will go further. That, that is what we are do, you're doing in facility management. Then. Yeah, but do you need to ask any special pieces in order to move that information? Sorry, special? Pieces. Yeah, no, no, yeah that, that's a standardization part. Uh, so we need to standardization that uh, we, we have correct information what we want. And our information has to be uh, in depending use cases. So that's why we need to know uh, what, how building owner wants to use our models. So we need to ask that information in really early phases of the project. Because everything is not possible. You, you cannot do it. You need to know what, how to make models, how, where to put information and so on. And that, after that, we can use data. Okay, thank you. One question for you. How do you manage what you, what you don't know? When you're scanning a historical building, you can get easily the geometry. But, but what do you do to add the address to the information? Do you trust in historical documents or? No, we don't trust anything. Yeah, yeah we, um, we, again, we only model what we know. So um, again, in, in those, um, um, in the models, in the uh, dialogue boxes, again, where the information came from is, is explicit. And again, if something um, hasn't been verified, again, by, by point cloud or um, by inspection, that's noted in the, uh, in the verification uh, mm -hmm. models. Okay. Bueno, pues creo que tenemos que abandonar la sala a menos cuarto y estamos pasados de tiempo. Así que muchísimas gracias a todos. Thank you. Thank you very much to you all. Y hasta pronto. <laughs>